So I'm Lyra, and I'm a vocalist and composer and producer based in Berlin. I'm really excited to be here today in the virtual studio with Leo Wyatt and Dan Keen from Spitfire Audio. Today, Leo and Dan will take us on a deep dive into their process of creating their latest sampled instrument made from recordings of the British countryside. They'll release the instrument as part of Spitfire Labs, a series of free software instruments that was launched in 2018. For Labs, they work with artists to create and release a new library every month. Their motto is, creativity shouldn't be complicated. We hope that today's session will offer you fresh knowledge on what makes a high quality and exciting sampled instrument and a new perspective and set of techniques for working with field recordings in your own music. Ready to jump in? First, let me introduce you to our guests. Leo Wyatt is a songwriter and producer focusing on collaboration with many great artists as well as in his own project, Kinder. At Spitfire Audio, Leo is a product manager overseeing the labs and Spitfire Audio recordings range. Dan Keen is a composer, producer, and musician based in London. Dan began contributing to Christian Henson's piano book community in December 2019, alongside accompanying content in his own YouTube channel, which led him to his role as in-house composer at Spitfire Audio. Leo, Dan, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Now, you're both based in London, right? That's right, yeah, we're here in uh, Studio A at Spitfire Audio. Great. Now, Dan, you've been a composer for a while now. How did you get into producing sampled instruments? Well, there's something really freeing about being able to create your own sounds. And uh, this is also something that is often a forged path in becoming a composer's assistant, something that I was kind of on my way to doing in becoming a media composer. Being able to create instruments out of either acoustic instruments or post-production-led practices from recording sounds in your back garden uh, seems like a nice way to be able to create your own unique voice as a, as a composer. So interesting. Um, now, Leo, uh, just to introduce us to you a bit, I imagine some folks might be wondering what your role as a product manager at Spitfire entails. I know you have quite an active role. Can you tell us a bit about what a day in your work is like? Yes. Uh, so as a product manager, um, the kind of main part of my role uh, is to oversee the planning and design of uh, products that we put out uh, on the labs range, uh, but also for essay recordings. Um, but I love to take an active role in the actual sound design and work and creation of those sounds. So I do a lot of kind of tweaking with sounds. And my day to day is pretty much um, hanging out with the team, making stuff that we're going we're gonna to explore today. Wonderful. Um, really good to be here with you both. Um, you've both been working on this instrument for a little while now. So I was wondering when people ask you what you're up to or what this is, what's your elevator pitch? Well, for me, this, this project was. Uh, a consequence of lockdown really. We didn't have any people we could record, all the studios were closed. And I one day heard quite a big open cloud burst at my home and I thought, oh, it would be cool to record that rain sound. Um, and then over the next few weeks, we I kind of sampled various sounds of thunder and birdsong and wind and uh, eventually had some samples which we could use as source material to turn into this instrument. But uh, it's a lot of kind of Toing and froing, really, a lot of collaboration. Um, but um, yeah, we created some sounds that we're really, really proud of. Great. And then how did you guys come to the decision to release it as part of the Lab series? Is, this, is, it, is it a similar kind of sound pack to what comes out in Labs? Yeah, we, uh, we had been originally recommended this by our co-founder, Christian Henson, who had heard Dan's uh, as collection of sounds before uh, we'd been uh, introduced at Spitfire. And it really stood out for me. I think for me, the things I love to hear in labs and what I love to explore is the idea of making sounds out of something completely left field, stuff that you wouldn't usually think about making sounds out of, I think. Um, and field recordings are really a classic example of that. You can make so much out of field recordings. There's so, much, uh, fre there's so many frequencies going on in, in, in any one of those. So there's all sorts of things you can make. Great. Uh, Dan, you said you recorded these at your home and it's in the countryside, right? Um, I heard you might have some pictures to share for us. 
of, of, the, of the actual home. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit what it's like there um, and how it was whenever you were actually making the field recordings. Were you alone? What time of day was it? What was the weather like? So my, my family home where I grew up is in the rural countryside in England. Um, and we've got quite a lot of fields behind us. Uh, and our back garden is always home to lots of birds and wildlife. And uh, I think the first sounds I recorded were the rain sounds. Because my home studio was on the top floor of our, uh, of our house, you would always hear the rain kind of pattering down on the, uh, on the roof. Um, and there was something really nice about taking just my camera microphone out. It's just a little Rode Video Micro, fairly cheap camera uh, microphone. But being able to sort of record these sounds and under an umbrella or going outside with some microphones and just kind of getting a feel for what, you know, what, what is in your back garden. Um, it's something that's so familiar to me. It's what's so familiar to a lot of other people as well. But um, yeah, I, I don't know why nature just seems to provide really interesting source material for, for sampling. Right, and you, you mentioned to me once also that you were recording over a period of six months. That's quite a, a dedicated process for recording. What, what about field recordings um, is particularly interesting to you as a compositional tool? Yeah, well, for me, at least, it's that kind of unpredictability. It's the sound of something coming up and kind of going away again. It maybe is a tone that isn't sustained. It's maybe not the same pitch every time. Um, and when you play this as part of an instrument, even if it is tonal, um, these little unpredictable flourishes that come in and out, the sound of a bird cooing or the sound of rain falling in a particular rhythm, um, is it, it inspires you then to create something else. And I think... An old teacher of mine always said that before you paint, you need to build the canvas. And for me, this, this forms as a very good textural bed uh, for, for making my compositions. Mm. I think from my point of view when writing songs, um, there's something about field recordings, or at least just f things I would use, like recordings of train stations or walking down the street, kind of more city landscapes. They just add that textural element to your music and just really put you in a place when you're listening to it. I think for me that's really important when I'm writing. Yeah, and I know, I know that a big part of your process is also, um, well, processing the sounds. Is, is it at all important for you to maintain the natural sound of the field recording as you're putting the instrument together? For me it was when I originally created uh, the, the lab's instrument. I think I wanted it to feel like it paid respect to the sound of a bird, the sound of rain falling. Uh, and sometimes you can maybe go a little bit too far and, and maybe you lose some of that original intention. For this instrument, I definitely wanted it to feel as authentic as possible so that each sound sounded true to the material that I had recorded. Um, but obviously, uh, as Leo will show, there are lots of other post-production processes where you can use that as source material and then take it really far and go really out there with, uh, yeah, with your sound production. Great, Dan. Yeah, you just mentioned um, it's possible to take it too far. Uh, Leo, how do you know when you have taken something too far when you're working on it? I think it's actually really important to, to start by going too far. Um, as something like when I load up a, a new field recording or a sound and I'm going to process it, I think it's important to find those boundaries. So when you start, you go too far and you know, okay, well, that's the limit. I'm not going to go any further than that. And then you work within those boundaries. And I think that's definitely the, the best starting point. Um, but yeah, you can go too far and have too much distortion or too much compression or something, and then you lose the magic of the field recording. Yeah, definitely. I also know, Dan, you've also worked on sampled instruments with like acoustic instruments or with percussive instruments. Is it particularly challenging to create an ambient or non-melodic sampled instrument? It definitely can be. I think with acoustic instruments, you know what you're aiming to replicate, I suppose. Um, whereas with these more organic textures, often, especially with the wind sample, which we'll show you, it's very full bandwidth. It takes up all of the frequencies. So you really have to be quite destructive in, in what you're looking to pull out of the samples. If you want it to feel particularly tonal, if you want it to have a darker tendency, that isn't necessarily something you can 
uh, manipulate by your choice of microphones, it's more the post-production. So I would say with recording acoustic instruments, it's about getting it at the source, performing it in an interesting way, um, using using a, a nice collection of microphones. But with this, the world really is your oyster and you can get really creative with it. All right, so now let's get into the nitty gritty a bit. I'm really curious how you guys put this instrument together. First, I'd really like us to talk through some of the techniques you use when making the sampled instrument. Maybe a good place to start would be finding the note or the tone. When you have a, a raw field recording, how do you find the tone in there? What is that process like? Yes, so I'll jump over to the computer and I'll show you. Um, we'll start by just having a listen to some of the samples. So you'll see here I've got the four here, which you can download at the end of the session and have a go with yourself. But we'll start by listening to the bird song. I'll only pay about 20 seconds, um, but you'll get the idea in that time. So there you go, you can hear all sorts of nice things in there. You can hear the birds, uh, you can hear some, also some very uh, loud British pigeons. Um, but you've also got the lovely kind of sound of just the, the outside, which in itself is a sound. Um, so finding the note, I think the, the first thing that we uh, did with organic textures was to use an EQ. Uh, so I'm just gonna drag this EQ, which is in my favorites in my effects section, and add that to the, the bottom there. And you see I've made, a self, made myself a preset which has all the different things I might use. And I've got here a notch uh, here, which I'll set to 440, which is the frequency of an A, just below middle C. And then I will turn up the gain and reduce the band so that it's really tiny. And what this will do is create a resonant sine tone which will, go, which will kind of bring out this, this middle A sine tone sound within the field recording. So you'll hear it change in the waveform, you see how it gets louder and quieter. Uh, the louder the waveform is, the more of that sine tone we're probably going to hear. So I'll just listen back to this now, having put this in, and see what it sounds like. So you just heard there a little tiny bit. I feel like we could go just a bit more. Uh, there are two ways to do that. You can increase the scale here, or you can just duplicate it. I think I'm going to duplicate it for now and have a listen to this now. So you can hear there, I almost did it a little bit too much. So I'm going to turn the scale down on this one. And then, because the dynamics of this sample are quite well, dynamic, I'm going to add a, a glue compressor, just a small tiny bit of compression to make sure we don't get any loud things jumping out and just have one last listen. All right, Leo, so the scale parameter, sorry to interrupt, the scale parameter is just bringing, uh, yes. it's, it's reducing uh, from 100 to something like, I don't saw where you, where you dragged it, but it's reducing the effect. It's like bringing it down via a percentage or something like this. Yes, exactly that. It reduces the amount that you're doing. And you can actually see when I drag it, the, uh, the blue line comes down. So if I go back to 100, you see it's all the way up. And then when I come back down to where I was, which is around 60, it's there. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to commit this to audio. And there are many ways you can do this. You can set up an audio track and set the output of this uh, to that audio track and record that down. Or you can do a quick way, which we do, which is to freeze the track, which freezes all of the plugin information as it is. And then I flatten that, and that commits it to audio. And you'll see the waveform will change. And it's, there you go, it's quite loud, but I'm sure it will sound good. And then what I'm going to do is drag it into this simpler. So I've just loaded up a simpler here, which is Ableton's built-in sampling tool. And I'm going to drag the sample in, and we can play this. I'm just going to move the start point along because I know that it's a little bit quiet at the start, but we'll be able to play this. Dan, do you want to have a play on the sure. keyboard? I'm just going to turn the warp off 
So you can hear there, we're still preserving all of the nice kind of bird sounds and even the pigeon is still there. But it's definitely got a resonant tone, which yes. is what you'd gravitate towards, I think, when, yeah. when playing with samples like this. Right. Dan, did you have something like this sound in mind when you were making this original recording? Were you thinking to like add tone to it like this? Yeah, definitely. I think um, if I were to take that low cut and pull it right in up to 440, we'd lose that sense of the ambience, we'd lose that sense of the wind. Uh, similarly, if we had a high cut and we pulled that also right down to 440, we, we would get, well, basically just a sine wave at 440, which wouldn't have that ambience. And I think like Leo said, when you're outside as well, there is that kind of high frequency content that you really want to uh, maintain. It's also worth bearing in mind that as you play below the sample, you're tuning it down so you're stretching it out. Whereas if we played that sample sped up like this, you can hear that all of those bird coups are being are being sped up quite a lot. So that's worth kind of keeping in mind as well, I think. Can I ask a, can I have a, I have a guilty, guilty question? I just, uh, or maybe a, a I just want to hear a big C major chord on that, like a big stacked C major chord. Can you give us one of those? Should we, should we team up? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Ready? <laughs> Sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, yes. so EQing is a really important part to create these resonant bands and sounds that don't have them. I think that's quite clear. Um, really useful trick that um, the viewers can use as well. I, I wonder what other types of processing you might use in your toolbox when you're putting together sampled instruments like this. Um, what, are, what, are, what are some of your other go-to tools? Another thing that I love to use, I'm a big fan of, is uh, Max for Live devices. And there's one in particular that I use on maybe every product I've worked on uh, at Spitfire, which is the Granulator 2. Um, I'm a big fan of granular synthesis, uh, and it works so well with field recordings. There's so much you can do with it. Um, maybe the Rain would be quite a good one to do. Yes. OK, let's try that. So I'll jump over to the computer again. Could you maybe yes. just explain quickly for folks who maybe have never used granular synthesis what, what that is as a, as a tool? Yes, of course. Yeah, I'll give a quick sound bite. Uh, so granular synthesis is where you take an audio sample and you split it up into tiny, tiny little bits of information of audio. And then you can shuffle them around and stretch them and pull them and basically create something brand new. The idea is that you can really remodel or redesign a sound uh, with granular synthesis, and that's why I love it so much. Great, awesome. Let's hear it. I'm really curious. Yes. So I'll do the same thing I did before with the rain sample. Um, we'll just have a listen to it first. Um, we want to get that resonant tone out again so that we have some tonal information that we can use when we drag it into the granular granulator. Uh, so we'll just listen to the rain for a bit. We all know what rain sounds like. So what's really nice about this sample is that you have that kind of really fast pitter-patter of the rain hitting an umbrella, right? So, That's right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the mic was just underneath it, yeah. We always have umbrellas in, in England. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's going to really add some kind of percussive element to the sound. So when the, uh, every time the rain hits the umbrella, you're going to hear a sign tone and it's going to sound really nice. So I'll do the same thing again. I will add an EQ to the rain track. Um, and then I'll set it to 440. Or maybe, I think I'll, we'll go an octave higher, actually. That'd be cool, yeah. So uh, if we can remember rightly, frequencies, they double. So 440 times 2, this should be an octave above the A, below middle C. And then I'll do the same again, turn the gain up and reduce the band. And then knowing that I had to do this in the last one, I'll duplicate and turn the scale down again and have a little listen, see what we've got. I just love that you can still hear the birds. <laughs> it's, it sounds <laughs> it's the same really garden. Nice. It's really relaxing actually, with the headphones on, listen to it. Mm. I'm just gonna, on this second EQ here, I'm just going to reduce some and take away some of the bass, because otherwise that might get really intense when we're using playing lower notes. Um, so I've just reduced that a tiny bit. 
Um, and then I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to freeze the track, which freezes all the information into place, and then flatten it down into audio. And then I'm going to drag it into the granulator. So I'll just unsolo that and hit arm that track and drag the rain in. And you'll see here there's loads of controls here that you can do. There's so much you can do in granulator. Um, but the two things that I'm going to concentrate on here are this dial here, grain, which allows you to choose a section of the audio and what you're working with uh, in the granulator. So you see on this screen here, this is the sample that we've dragged in. And there's a little bit here that's highlighted. That's the grain selection tool. So if I go all the way up here and play it, it will be a really tiny grain, almost like a one bit sound. And you can't even really hear anything to do with rain there, can you? That's some lovely rainfall. Yeah. It's a nice sound, but not for what we're going for here. So I'm going to bring it all the way back as far as I can. And there you go, lovely. Let's play some chords. Really nice. One thing I'm going to also change as well is this. I'm going to add this second dial here, which is the spray dial, which allows us to use different bits from outside of the section uh, of the grain section that we've got. So you'll see when I play and I turn this up, there are white lines coming up or different colored lines which show you which bits are being used. And when I've got the spray turned up, you'll see the lines appearing outside of that box. So if I play the same chord again. And then I'll turn the spray up and you'll see the lines appearing outside of the box. There you go. Really lovely. That's nice. So it's adding yeah. this nice bit of randomness where you're scanning different sections of the sample and it gives it this even more organic kind of feel. Exactly, yes. It's, uh, it's random every time, yeah. Yeah, so Dan, um, listening to this, this version of that sample in the granulator, are you still in the countryside at your house? Does it still feel like the original field recording that you made? I think so, yeah. I think um, it, it's, interest, it's always interesting hearing how people will do things with your own source materials, and obviously I hope to uh, hear examples of that in the materials that we've left as a link uh, available to download for everyone else as well. Um, but yeah, I, I just love it. it. It's that thing of that kind of sporadic, slightly unpredictable <coughs> nature. In fact, when you turned up the spray, that really started to feel real. Um, I would maybe do something next with like a tremolator or something to, to give it that kind of stereo spread as well. But it's, uh, it's yeah, it's really, it's, yeah, sounds great. That's wonderful. I have a few more questions I'm really curious to ask, but if you want to demo anything else for us, uh, now would be the time. Yes, I'll show you one trick that I love doing uh, to things like this, especially these kind of pad sounds. I've got um, the Sound Toys packs installed here. I love using the uh, crystallizer. So I'm going to load a crystallizer here onto the same one we were just on, um, the granulator instrument. And I've just got it on the default setting. And this is another granular tool, by the way. This is a granular echo synthesizer. Um, you can tell I love granular synthesis. Um, so I'm going to put this up to 1,200 cents, which is an octave, uh, and then turn up the recycle. And you'll hear what happens here is it will take a note and then give you this echo that's constantly going up in octaves. If any of you have used Crystallizer before, you'll, you'll be able to recognize the sound in every song that uses it. It's a very distinctive sound, but there is a way you can do something different to it, which I haven't heard as much, but I think is brilliant for kind of spooky sci-fi scores and cues that you might be doing. So I've just duplicated the Crystallizer here. It's the same setting, and I'm putting it to, I'd say, about 10, 20. I'm going to go for 30 because I'm feeling wild. Uh, and this is going to add a kind of a chorus, wild chorus effect, because it's going to duplicate up 30 cents every time. Very subtle effects. I think I might just go a little bit further and just show you how crazy it can go. So let's go to 50.
I can hear there, we've taken something that's actually quite calming and, and nice to suddenly be really eerie <laughs> and freaky and scary. So that's great. there's really so much you can do uh, with field recordings. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, that ended up sounding really like powerful and odd and um, but still like we were discussing before retaining that character where you can still really feel the place um, and I think that's really cool so Leo how how do you get inspired uh, for the labs series like what what kinds of things inspire you for each release um, what what kinds of things are you thinking about in in putting together this series of sampled instruments? I think anything that sounds out of the ordinary that uh, it just really excites me. I think there is obviously fun and, and beauty in recording instruments as they are, but there is also so much fun in exploring uh, things that haven't been done before. And sound design is one of those things where I could just do this forever. It's kind of a real rabbit hole uh, experience. And, and, and nearly every labs we do or every product we work on, there is a, a point where we start doing sound design and we have to stop ourselves. Um, and things like this with the field recordings is definitely one of those ones where we could have really worked on it for weeks and weeks and had more than probably what our labs would usually have, uh, more sounds than we need. Awesome. You mentioned also um, if people might be working on cues, you know, and like a use case. I mean, you must also be thinking about the end user a lot, uh, musicians, composers, who would actually end up using these uh, packs in their work. Are you being totally intuitive when you're designing these packs? Or is there also some research going in uh, based on, you know, use cases or something like this? I think as long as the the sound that, or the idea that we have is is exciting us, I think it will definitely excite composers out there. There are obviously things that um, people want us to do, and we we kind of eventually get to those things. But we want to do them in our way, and we want it to feel natural. Um, and there, and you know, as long as as long as I am excited by what we're making, I think I'm feeling comfortable in what we we're, we're doing with labs. Wonderful, yeah. I mean, just just scrolling the page, I mean, there's so many interesting th things there for me as a musician, so many interesting different sounds. Um, this question goes to both of you. Maybe, Dan, you could answer first. Um, what do you think are some of the most important uh, aspects or elements of a good sampled instrument? Well, I think it's it has to be intention first. Um, and I think, you know, there, are, there will be some people who want to prioritize lots of dynamic layers or loads of round robins, but ultimately none of that matters if the instrument doesn't sound that exciting, doesn't sound that fun. So I think a key thing at, at Spitfire as well is that everyone is a key musician and, and you can really hear that in the samples that are being made and there's a key, a key drive towards uh, things that, that we find naturally, naturally musical. But I would say as far as sampling is concerned, there is something interesting about capturing the slight imperfections, um, an interesting way for something to be played, or little noises in the chair sometimes just make things feel a little bit more realistic, rather than, as we could have demonstrated, filtering out to just the note, you lose everything else, you lose the character that comes with it. Mm. And for me, I think it's really important for sounds to be malleable and evolve. Um, we do a lot of things in labs and also just in sampling in general. There's lots of work done using the mod wheel on a keyboard, which allows you to crossfade between different layers. And for me, that for a lot of people, that might seem like a really simple thing of being able to fade between different dynamic layers of kind of recording soft and loud. But for me, it's the ability to really transform a sound and make it uh, evolve as you play it. And if you can do that by velocity on your keyboard by hitting harder or by using the mod wheel. I think that for me is what I look for when I'm, when I'm making sample instruments. Really interesting. I, I love to hear both of your perspectives on this. Um, just one, one, one final thing before we go to an attendee Q&A. Um, we both uh, had already spoken a bit about, um, well, this is something that's really important for me is like the kind of organizational <coughs> side of um, making electronic music, the boring stuff, so, um, or, or the kind of technique behind it. Can you maybe just briefly explain how you, how you wrap this up and turn it into a finished instrument? Yes, I'll show you a technique that I use on the computer again. So I'll just go over again, and we'll work with the granulator that 
I have loaded up here. And one thing I love to do with the granulator specifically, uh, so this is what I'm about to do is, is bounce this down to audio and take it out of the door. So I'm going to take this pre-made uh, MIDI clip here, which I've written, which has, when I open it up, you'll see that there are different notes here. I'm just sampling here in perfect fourths. Um, and I'm giving myself a good gap between the end of the first note and the beginning of the next one so that I can capture the tail of the note so I don't have any kind of bleed between the notes. Uh, I'll drag that in to the granulator. So this will now play these notes. I could probably add a little bit more time in there, but I won't do that now because um, you didn't hear it die out properly. But what I love to do with the granulator, as it's random and it's creating different versions of it every time, I love to make a copy of it and pan them left and right so that you hear different things in both ears. Um, so I'll show you how I do that now. So I've just duplicated the track and I'm going to pan this one all the way left. I'm going to pan this one all the way right. And then to commit that to audio, I'm going to put that into a group. So I hit Command G and that's put that into a group here. And then I'll just play it for you now so you can hear it. So I'll just solo the group so I don't hear the other sounds. So you should hear there's a very subtle difference between the two sounds on, on both sides. And then what I would do then is name this something helpful. So if it command R to name this, I'm going to call this Rain Pad. And I'm going to add an audio track, which I did by hitting Command T. And then I'm going to set the input here, which is on this bit here on the right, the controls. And I'm going to set it to Rain Pad. So what's that? What that's going to do is record this group with the two tracks inside it. And then I would hit record and go. Normally I would hit R, but I'm going to hit the record button. Now, I'm not going to put you through the whole process of listening to us recording audio because that's not the fun bit. But I'm going to show you what we would do after this. So you see here we've got the two notes. We would then take this audio and we'd cut it into all the individual notes by splicing. I did that with Command E. And then we would uh, bounce these out uh, and then rename them outside of uh, Ableton. And then, and then we'd make a sample instrument in the lab's engine. Very detailed work, but very worthwhile. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, great, so we wanna go to some attendee questions now. Just take a breath, collect ourselves, pondering all of the interesting stuff we were just talking about. Um, I have a question here from Chris Hawk, who asks, what kind of tools do you use to get rid of wind or background noise? We very extensively use uh, Isotope RX, which I think is kind of the industry standard for uh, denoising and taking things out. Um, yeah, use that a lot. Right, yeah, I'm also, I'm also a big fan of RX. I use it quite a lot. I record my voice a lot, and um, there's always a lot of clicks and noise in there. Also, it's a great tool to have for like, um, for like bedroom producers, or if you're not in an ideal acoustic environment, and definitely for field recordings. Um, another question coming in, which mic or which kind of mics do you use for field recording? Well, I would always suggest a stereo pair most of the time when you can. Uh, three of these recordings were actually made in mono, so we had to do quite a bit of work to give it that stereo image. Um, but I think really whatever microphone you've got with you is, is going to be the best one. So if you've got a handheld recorder or a stereo microphone that you could maybe plug into your phone or something like that, um, you know, you don't have to have the best equipment just to get started with this stuff. But I definitely recommend stereo. Would you? Yeah, I would also just add to that and say that you can use anything, really. I mean, I use my phone more mm. than any other microphone when I'm recording because it's about being in the moment. Absolutely. You might be walking through the street or something and hear something or hear a weird noise and then the only thing you often have is your phone and I will 
hit record on the voice memos on my iPhone and, and record that and then take it home. And I think there's something beautiful about the lo-fi sound. Absolutely. Although yeah. they're not very lo-fi anymore phones, are they? <laughs> no, that's true. Right. So, so you can use your phone and like really catch something on the go to like really get that, you know, these gems that are flying around our head all the time, you know, and capture some of those. You can also, uh, you know, get a nice stereo mic like Dan suggested and go on a little excursion, go on a planned excursion and maybe go in, go in actively listening. Um, Christy asks, what field recordings or places maybe to record are on your bucket list? Um, maybe, maybe Leo and Dan, you could each give us uh, some, some maybe fantasy or, or desired spots to record. I would love to go to a really long decaying cave at some point. Have you ever sampled a cave? I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah. I think big reverby spaces for me are the things that, like weird rooms, weird, weird places that aren't kind of box rooms. So like mm. the inside, like the crater of a volcano, for example. That would be amazing. Would be amazing, just yeah. thinking about the reverb. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anywhere you would like, uh, you, would, you would travel to um, that was maybe even even a noisier environment that could be interesting. I remember reading about like field recorders also like in deserts and how they would like keep the sand out of their mics and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I think I also really get excited by cityscapes as well. I, I really love cities and there's lots of kind of, in your head you can imagine what a certain city sounds like just by from, from watching movies. They're really important sound textual elements in movies when you might be walking through New York. And I've never been to New York, but I already know what it sounds like because someone's done a really detailed sound recording. Yeah, of it. Right. So I'd love to go to New York and make some kind of similar things like we've done here using uh, my phone, probably. Mm. Yeah, nice. I, I think, yeah, New York is really overwhelming. I can't imagine recording in New York because I'm like always really overwhelmed when I'm there, but I, you would get some amazing stuff for sure. Um, I have a question from Riaz, and Riaz asks, after listening to a field recording, what makes you decide whether to make a sample into a tonal instrument or a textural one? Uh, meaning tonal instrument as a lead and textural as more of a pad. Mm, that's interesting. I think for the field recordings that I've taken and turned into instruments, they've always ended up being fairly pad-like for me. But then I guess you tend to do quite a lot of distortion and stuff, don't you? Does that mm. take well to being a lead instrument over a pad? Yeah, I think for me it's an instinctual thing. You can, you can really hear in certain recordings, if we were to just think about the ones we have today with the bird song one, there's lots of interesting melodic tonal things happening. But then the rain, for example, could also really work as a drum kit. You could really work with that. Um, I also like to think of it really literally and look at the waveform and see how much dynamic is going on and see if it looks like anything I know. Like uh, there might be, you might be that you're hitting something in your field recording and it looks like a kick drum. And then my initial reaction will say, well, I'll make a kick drum. Um, but it may look like a pad and then and that seems to be the right direction. But it's important that it's trial and error. Definitely. I think it, it takes a couple of... Um, goes to make something that really works for a sound. So I think try everything is my motto. Yeah, and I also find that things that have a quite a quiet dynamic take well to multiple layers of that thing. If you've got something that's really gritty and grindy, it might sound great as one sample, but as a chord of six or eight notes, it could get a bit overwhelming maybe. Yeah. But um, if you've got something really soft and gentle, it often pairs really well mm. together somehow. You're right, you mentioned also, and I was thinking about this when when we were playing back the sound, but if you made that ra rain sample into a percussive instrument, would you really zoom in and like try to isolate just like a single transient in there to make like one drum sound? Or like, how would you go about that? It's a lot of rain. It is it a, is a, rain. It's a lot, there's a lot of rain here in this country, but yes, I would, <laughs> I would uh, yeah, I, th I think I would try both things. I think I would really zoom in on a single transient and try and make one kick drum out of it, if I can find one across a sample. But then I think I would also try uh, using Ableton's warp function to really stretch and pull things and really mess with it and try and make something glitchy, like a glitchy drum kit, I think. But also, even if you don't want to use it solely as the sound source of a snare drum or something, 
I imagine using that rain as like part of a reverb tail or a snare or something like that could could add a nice textural mm. thing. It doesn't have to be right at the very front. It can always you can always create these little layers that uh, make up the arrangement. Continually uh, astounded by the possibilities of electronic music production. It's just this never ending. Um, ecstasy of possibilities. I have a question from Martha who asks, um, where does your idea for a new instrument begin uh, when you create or when you explore sounds or um, how, do you, how do you start or how could you start? I think for me, it's, it's, you can definitely go out with an intention to, to find an idea and there might be something that you're excited to record or you might have, like we've discussed before, you might have a place you want to go and make a day of it and record some stuff. But equally on the other side, there's that feeling of um, spontaneity, which for me, I get most of my inspiration from spontaneous discovery of a sound or, <clears throat> or, or something in nature or, um, yeah, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, it's funny, when you, I mean, it, it de definitely takes practice. Um, I find that if I start once I've done a few instruments um, and I've kind of whittled it back to the thing that created the sample, uh, when I start playing around with instruments that I really love or hearing particular sounds, you just develop a bit of a sixth sense for what sounds might be good within a sample. Um, and I've sampled pianos that I loved and, and knew that they would sample well. Um, and with these field recordings, knew that the bird song could make for an interesting instrument. Um, so I think it definitely takes practice just to get to find that sound that you're that is going to become part of your voice, um, but uh, but eventually you do just kind of you, you just get to know your your preferences. I think. Great. Um, I just have one more. We have time for one more question. This is from Christy Cross, and maybe uh, just we make it like a snap fun question. What was the most fun, awkward, or frustrating field recording you ever made? I recently sampled Hyde Park in London. And uh, there was a very smelly bin, which <laughs> wasn't particularly enjoyable to sample, but it does sound very cool. It's made a very good sub kick. I, I actually recently sampled my noisy neighbours who were playing really loud music and made a really cool drum kit. That's a true story. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> that is also quite a, quite a pandemic music making story as well. Just sitting within four yeah. walls, what do I hear? Um, Dan, Leo, thank you so much. This is so informative and I'm feeling really, really inspired. And um, thank you for sharing so generously your expertise uh, in, this, in this field and in your work. Um, you know, I work with recorded samples a lot in my own composition and I'm feeling really motivated to try out some of these different technical processes and organizational techniques that you mentioned uh, that could take my own sampled instruments to the next level. I am not nearly as organized as you guys are. It's also just extremely exciting to see what is possible in sampling and resynthesis um, and to, you know, really to be able to go out, hear something maybe only once, um, turn it into data, into a concrete file and sequence it, process it, layer in it into digital space. This is just like so fascinating, I think, and so much possibility there. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for inspiring all of our attendees today. Um, it was really, truly a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. It was a pleasure. Thank you.